station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, we are ready for the event. Newsweek Magazine, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Castaway Madrano, science reporter, Newsweek Magazine. How do you hear me? Hello, Castillo. We hear you loud and clear. How us? Perfect. I hear you guys loud and clear also. Excellent. Am I clear to start? You bet. Welcome to the International Space Station. I got uh, Nora Shige Kanai on my left, and uh, I'm Scott Tingle. Hi, Scott. Um, yeah, I was just about to ask how I was speaking to you. Thank you so much. This is uh, actually my first call to the ISS, so I'm very happy uh, that you guys were able to take the time to speak with me. Um, so the, the first thing I wanted to ask, I know this is uh, the first space flight uh, for both of you, and you both have completed spacewalks over the last couple of weeks. I was hoping you could maybe um, just take a minute to describe kind of the physical effects or sensations um, that sort of took you by surprise that people might not know about. Um, Mr. Kanai, I know you were a Navy diver, and I'm sure you both have extensive diving experience as part of your training. Um, I'm actually a diver myself, but I've obviously never been to space, so I was just really curious about uh, the physical sensation and how, uh, and, and how that went over with you guys. So the uh, the good news is is that we have incredibly thorough and uh, intense training for uh, years before we come up here to do a, a real life uh, spacewalk. Um, but you're right; it is physically demanding, and because you're you're exerting so much uh, effort um, just to operate the suit, to get in and out of the suit, and uh, you're out there for six or seven hours at a time, and you're in the suit for up to ten to eleven hours at a time. Um, it can. It's very physically demanding, and and when you're exerting that much effort, um, it uh, you have to really concentrate on the job and keeping your mental facilities going in the uh, right direction. Um, it's uh, it's it's truly a, a challenge. Uh, heading out the door is uh, like going outside, and you've been stuck in the house for a month or two. It's uh, exhilarating and exciting. Uh, and uh, and in the back of your head, you also know that it's dangerous, so you need to do uh, everything right. Uh, the thing that surprised me is, you know, when we're in the pool and we're training, we go out of the airlock and we see the bottom of the pool, and so we kind of know where we're at and we get used to seeing that. When you go out the airlock here on station, you see Earth, and it's going by very quickly, and uh, and it's uh, it seems like it, you're just in a different place, and it's a little bit easy to get disoriented, but you stop, you think. And then you realize it's exactly like training. And uh, so that was, uh, was a, a really uh, good eye opener for me. I'll let, you, I'll let uh, Nemo here answer as well. I just want to uh, rephrase what Scott mentioned now. Actually, we had uh, lots of training sessions on the ground. And uh, moving inside the spacesuit is very difficult, physically demanding. But uh, we are used, kind of used to that feeling, and uh, the real spacewalk was uh, uh, actually the feeling like walking or training in the pool. It's similar sensation, similar feeling, and uh, I was surprised how they are close each other. Yeah, that uh, that does seem surprising. I. Uh, the next thing I wanted to ask about was just sort of now that you guys have been in space for a while, um, the, the physical uh, effects that you feel most. Um, Mr. Kanai, I, I know there was the, you know, the misunderstanding about the growth spurt, but I, I think the general public tends to not realize how many different ways being in space affects your body beyond just things like bone density. I know there can be uh, changes to your vision or inflammation or any, uh, everything like that. So I was wondering uh, what physical effects you two are feeling most and then what kind of preventative measures or daily practices you or routines you complete to try to, to cut down on any damage. Uh, 
so there's, uh, like you said, there's lots of things that uh, go on with the body. Uh, the first thing is uh, you end up uh, going through a fluid shift. So a lot of the fluids that are in your legs and in your belly, they, they end up migrating up higher and, and leveling out throughout your body. So you feel bloated, you, f you look puffy, and, uh, and that uh, sometimes it can cause headaches and it, it's theorized it could be part of the, uh, the vision problem that, uh, that we've noticed with the swelling uh, ocular nerves. Um, but the... Uh, uh, the uh, the other thing you mentioned was the uh, the vision. Um, fortunately uh, for myself, I have not noticed any uh, degradation in vision uh, yet. Uh, we've only been up only halfway through our uh, deployment now, but uh, um, so the the clock is still ticking. But uh, so far, so good, and I'm pretty sure Nemo's the same way that his vision's uh, pretty much uh, pretty good. Uh, but the, the big thing that we really guard against is bone density loss. That's probably the biggest uh, thing that we, uh, we are, are concerned with. And uh, the way we mitigate that is through uh, resistive weight training. We have a, a machine up here. It's called ARED. Uh, it's an acronym, A-R-E-D. Uh, but uh, it uh, simulates weight training for us. We do lots of squats. We do lots of uh, bench presses. We do lots of uh, exercises, heel raises, uh, things like that to keep the uh, the uh, load-bearing activity onto our body so that it uh, does not lose uh, bone density. And what we found is that if we can, we can, if we work out for an hour to two two hours a day uh, lifting weights, that our bone density loss we can just about manage to uh, to keep very very low. Uh, over the course of six months on orbit. Um, actually, if you if you have a moment, uh, anyone just and wouldn't mind describing what are sort of the the specifics of that routine. So you said you work out for an hour or two every day, and it's uh, primarily squats and bench presses. Yes, actually, we have a, a professional trainer on the ground, and we do everyday exercise. Uh, according to their prescription and it's very specific and weight training and uh, uh, cardiac uh, pulmonary cardiac training like uh, uh, ergometer or treadmill perfect thank you um now that uh, expedition 54 has come to a close i, I know it's a few more weeks uh, till the other half of your new crew arrives to uh, to bring you back up from three, but what upcoming projects uh, will you be engaging in that uh, that kind of excite you guys most? And will many of them focus on our ability to do deep space travel, like uh, plant production so we can grow our own food in space, uh, or protecting astronauts from radiation uh, for crewed Mars missions, or things like that, just uh, upcoming research, and uh, whether a lot of it will focus on deep space travel. Sure. Well, the uh, the things that we're uh, working on uh, currently, and that'll take us through the next three weeks, um, uh, like you said, we're uh, working on our veggie program, and uh, we have plants growing in the uh, Columbus uh, module uh, right now. They're getting they're getting big. I'm really impressed with them. We water them every day. We the lights come on at uh, programmed uh, times to to give them energy, and uh, and it's really amazing how fast that uh, that they're growing. Um, so I, I'm guessing that uh, in another uh, another week or so that uh, we'll probably uh, start looking at harvesting and uh, getting them uh, uh, into uh, um, you know vials for the uh, test team and uh, getting them on ice so we can send them back home and they can uh, they can do some more research uh, with them on the ground. Um, as far as uh, tomorrow, uh, we're doing some uh, robotics and robotics control research, which is uh, very interesting to me. Uh, we'll be uh, looking and uh, working with a, a robot named Justin uh, down uh, located in Munich. And so uh, we'll be uh, trying to send commands and accomplish tasks. And we're doing that to simulate being in orbit around another planet, such as Mars or the moon, and controlling robots to, to do um, all the expl exploratory things that uh, that uh, we would like them to do, and then other than that, uh, in the next uh, week or so, we're going to start our path to uh, EVA um, pre uh, preparations. When uh, Drew and uh, Ricky get up here, uh, we're going to be very busy working up to an EVA. They have an EVA about uh, five or six days after they get here, and uh, we'll, Nemo and I will be preparing all of the uh, all of the equipment and uh, getting uh, getting all the uh, procedures ready so that uh, when they get here. Here we can uh, we can hit the deck running. Um, one thing that I was uh, really interested in seeing how you both feel is 
the sort of the, the debate around the importance of returning to the moon uh, weighted against the importance of sending crewed missions to Mars. So especially in light of uh, Trump's proposed budget, I usually just hear the perspectives of other journalists or people in the privatized space flight industry saying that the moon uh, is more of a dead end that will tie up money and resources that would be better directed toward Mars. Uh, but as astronauts, what is your what do you two think about uh, any value in prioritizing the moon like this, or where would you like to see uh, our energy spent? So, you know, when you look at, uh, if you take a, um, a tennis ball and a golf ball and you hold them at arm's length away, uh, that's, uh, you need about 10 of those to 100 of those uh, of, of distance to Mars. So going to Mars is, is a much bigger task, a, a much more demanding task than going to, um, going to the moon. We have a lot of research. We have a lot of development that we need to do. We need to develop our techniques for guarding against radiation. We need to uh, develop our techniques for how we're going to control vehicles. We need to develop our uh, procedures and how we're going to manage our bodies and being in space for that long. Uh, and there, there are operational concepts that uh, will drive systems design to make the trip to Mars possible. And the only way that we're going to know if those work before we send somebody on a two-year mission to Mars is if we have a place to test them and if we have a place to to um, develop our procedures, develop our systems. And the moon is the perfect place for that. And uh, it's fairly close. If something goes wrong, we can be home in two or three days. Uh, if we set up an orbit around the moon, we can test robots down on the surface of the moon and, uh, and see how things uh, work. Uh, we can test growing our own uh, agriculture, uh, either in orbit around the moon or in habitats upon the moon. Uh, so, you know, from my perspective, I see is going back to the moon is critical. And uh, some folks say that, uh, well, we've done that before, and we, we have done it before, and that, that's part of the risk management. But the folks that did it before, are, are a lot of them are out of the industry right now. While we still have a lot of the corporate knowledge, we have a very young crowd, and, uh, and we need to be taking these smaller steps before we, we head out on a, on a mission to Mars. It's very possible to do this, but I think the moon will be a proving ground for us to get there. Perfect. I um, yeah, definitely been curious as to as to how you guys uh, feel about that. One thing uh, that you did mention that I also wanted to ask about is the the issue uh, of radiation for astronauts in deep space travel. I've uh, I've been reading about a lot of recent research trying to to guard against that. What do you guys think will be uh, sort of the next step in terms of researching different ways to protect against radiation? That's a great question, and uh, actually, we are using uh, uh, International Space Station to determine how to protect the radiation or how much radiation we have right now. So actually, I have a dosimeter in my pocket. The, the crew always wear dosimeters and uh, measure the radiation every day, and uh, we can evaluate after the mission. So this kind of... Uh, very uh, basic uh, data is very, very important for the future exploration. And you said it, uh, it measures your radiation exposure. Is that something that it updates you uh, with the levels every day, or you can only find out uh, your, how, much personal uh, how much radiation you've been exposed to personally after you land back on the ground? Yes, uh, crew worn dosimeter is only evaluated after the mission, but we have another kind of, kind of devices all around the space station. Some are real time reading, some are uh, bring back and evaluate. So uh, that's a great research in the radiation protection field in the space station. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, one other thing kind of 
related to the the moon versus Mars thing, I wanted to know how you both feel uh, about kind of the rise of the privatized spaceflight industry and the idea, uh, I guess, that they present a sort of space tourism going forward that, you know, certain companies will, if you can afford it, will be able to take kind of tourists into like a low orbit or maybe potentially close to the moon. How do you guys feel uh, about that development uh, potentially coming around over the next couple of years? I think in general, we're all uh, very excited to see that happen. Humans are in space to stay and uh, and uh, bringing uh, commercial entities uh, into the uh, to the environment and the community and the culture is uh, is great it's going to it's going to improve uh, the amount of people looking at our systems it's going to improve the talent that we have creating new systems and uh, and it's going to um, get costs down so that it'll be more affordable for everybody so we're really happy about it uh, perfect yeah I, uh, I was hoping you guys would be um, then I guess with the, the remaining couple of minutes that we have, uh, any additional details you could provide about the, uh, the uh, research projects that Expedition 55 uh, will be going into? Uh, I know we touched earlier on growing plants and things like that, um, but just sort of the, the specific research that you'll, that you'll be getting into uh, and what you're most particularly excited about. Yes, uh, personally, I am expecting uh, or getting excited about the uh, protein crystallization experiment in the Japanese module. And the protein uh, crystallization in space uh, is much more uh, high, higher quality protein we can get in space than uh, bring back uh, Earth, that crystal, and uh, analyzing that then we can uh, uh, we can figure out the detailed detailed structure of the protein then that kind of research uh, will make uh, new drugs or makes uh, finding a new material for the uh, drugs and the medical field and it's very uh, beneficial for the uh, earth the people in the earth And some of the other uh, research that we have going on uh, over here to my my right, uh, we have a, a combustion rack that uh, we're doing a little bit of research on uh, cold flames, uh, as well as with atomization. Uh, both uh, I'm a thermal sciences uh, background for my academic training, and uh, it's very interesting to me. And uh, in the rack right next to it, we have our fluids research, and they're doing a lot of capillary flow type uh, type experiments. So I'll be really interested in seeing some of the results that uh, uh, on their reports uh, when I get back from uh, from this mission to see. Uh, see what we did. Great. Uh, and when you say fluids researching and capillary flow, would that be to study the effects of the pressure in space on blood flow within your bodies? Is my understanding of that right? Well, with the with the with the flows and the you know atomization and propagation of flame, as uh, well as the uh, the fluid uh, flows, the capillary flows, you know, we get rid of the body force uh, gravity, uh, but we do. Uh, so you have surface tension and you have uh, the other uh, propelling forces, uh, whether it's coming through a nozzle uh, from a pump or if it's uh, just natural. Uh, so. Uh, you know, they're, it's uh, just very interesting to uh, to see the different uh, different things that uh, that they're using to uh, do these investigations, and um, and a lot of it will have uh, great impact uh, at home, such as bringing down fuel um, uh, or, or maybe driving changes in our uh, internal combustion engines, bringing down uh, costs of uh, of engines if we can uh, run at a colder flame, uh, things like that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I think we just have a minute or so left, so I, I won't start a long new topic uh, that will get you cut off. But I guess anything else uh, that either of you would like to add just about how you're feeling about the upcoming missions in general, just, uh, anything uh, that you would want to add to to sign off about. And again, thank you. So Expedition 55 will start off with a with a, a big uh, bang. We got a lot of operations planned. Uh, we'll start off with an EVA, uh, maybe two or three EVAs. Uh, we also have uh, SpaceX uh, coming up and uh, dropping off some cargo, and then uh, we'll have um, 
uh, orbital coming up and uh, dropping off some cargo, which means there's lots and lots of work. There's lots and lots of science coming up. Uh, it's going to be very busy. Uh, right now, we're uh, just uh, laying the foundation to, uh, to, to be organized and to be ready so that when Mike gets here, we can hit the deck running. But it'll be a busy two months. So uh, stay tuned to NASA TV and www.nasa.gov to, uh, to see what's going on with the details. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both so much. I, uh, I know it's 125 now, so I, I believe that, uh, that that is all the time I have. Uh, Alexandra? Or? Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.